If they're not in the venue, but they're behind and they just want to watch it from afar, what do we do if they call out some type of risk or some type of vulnerability? Hey, I think that guy has a gun and he's up on the roof. So I guess the first thing, Jim, is where were you on Saturday when this went down? Oh, yeah. So flying back from Tampa, um, boarded. it. We're sitting there, 611 flight, uh, heading back up this way. And a guy behind me says, holy, holy shit. Um, they're shooting at him. Trump just got shot at. So, uh, and then everybody went dark. You know, everybody kind of, we lost. People were trying to get Wi-Fi. And I start getting, my phone just starts blowing up um, with a bunch of different stuff, like uh, bad information. The guy across from me is like, yeah, it was just a shot. It hit like the, um, you know, it hit a piece of glass and uh, it, it shot into his eye. So I'm like, okay, we got to stop, you know. So really was out of touch for a couple hours, but um doing the best I could to kind of get messages and get information from people and, you know, getting a lot of different, um, definitely getting a lot of different mixed messages as to what the status was. We knew he was still alive, but we weren't sure exactly what the extent of the injuries or what happened. Um, so uh, long flight, a uh, couple hour flight. By the time I got off, you know, we kind of got caught up pretty quickly. So I had told you off air and then I had also – Talked about this on my live last night. Something's wrong with my headphones. I'll fix them in a minute. Right. I had talked about it on my live last night, how a lot of the guys I spoke with mentioned that this was the minute a bullet flew, it was a failure. So you are, among many other things, a security expert. And looking at the outline here and the fact that they were only really advising on inside of 400 feet, how would you have done that perimeter ahead of the event itself? How far would you yeah. have looked at? I think the key to this and the key to everything, whether it be the military, whether it be um, with FBI or um, with any other federal agency, Secret Service, uh, it, the advanced party really guides the way these things go. They set the tone. Um, keep in mind, in this instance, I thought there was a lot of things that I saw that were great. Um, there were a bunch of things that I think we could do better and I'm not going to rip a fellow agency, a sister agency, but there's a lot of things that we, um, well, I'm going to rip them. There's a lot of things that were really shitty, right? So from my, from my standpoint, it all starts with the advanced team and they're busy right now. I mean, he's flying all over the place. Keep in mind, he's a former president. He's not the current president. Um, I think, um, you know, it's a little bit of a different outlook when we think about an assessment, whether it be site surveys, which are the physical assessment of the area, whether it just be your interviews or your check in social media or um, your different chatter that we kind of want to be exposed to the different intel, the source interviews and all those things that go with that um, is not as significant because of resource, money, um, having to push it up the ladder, having to make better decisions um, to keep within budget. So you'll see a lot of times those formers, you know, like uh, Jimmy Carter, who has beat, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> when I go into hospice, I would like to go to the Jimmy Carter hospice territory, whatever that looks oh. like. But, but so you're not going to get a lot of, um, a lot of people that are going to be actually assigned to the formers. Now, Trump's active. He's running for president. It's a little bit different, but let's just compare it quickly to RFK Jr., right? So RFK Jr. has been uh, applying for and asking for Secret Service protection for a couple of years. Now, I think Andy has talked about this, that we actually put in a proposal for RFK Jr. security a few you years. And Andy Bustamante. Andy Bustamante. Yeah. We put it in like a year or two ago and um, never heard back. So um, we, we think we might start hearing a bunch of things here in the in the very near future. Um, <laughs> but, but like your advanced party is the key. And what do they have? What's their requirement is to make those types of decisions, to look around that perimeter. Here's where the stage is going to be set up. You know, here's where we're going to have, um, you know, the, the teleprompters, which is what that guy said. You know, a bullet hit the glass on the teleprompter and it bounced off and just hit uh, hit Trump's ear. OK, um, but my, my thought is, what did that advance party do? What was their guidance? Who was working on that advance party? How senior were they? How experienced were they in checking out venues, checking out outside venues, mm. especially? And if nothing else if nothing else happens, I don't really look at the the amount, the, the yardage or the meters or the feet from the stage. I look at high ground, low ground, right? Mm. So there should never be a time where any 
building or any area that's higher than the stage, the dais, should ever not be secured. Now, I don't mean it has to be, you have to have somebody up on that area, but you definitely have to reduce access. You have to not allow anyone to get near that or at least have a local you know, police officer, have a county police officer or sheriff, have a state police officer, have another federal agency that's aware of those particular areas. And they're talked about and the communications are talked about. How are we going to make sure that no one gets to those spots? And God forbid, if they do get to those spots, how much quicker of a reaction do we need to have to right. get them the fuck off those spots? That's right. Period. That did not, in my opinion, now I, I wasn't in the meetings. I've done meetings like this my whole career. I, I have to believe that had to be talked about. Now, what did the advance party look like? That's the first question I would ask. So people were asking this this Senate hearing or this um, you know, this House hearing, they're going to talk to the Secret Service director. And what's the first question to be asked? Who did the advance? That would be my first question. Who did the advance? I want names. I want experience. I want where they were assigned before, what they did before, how many vulnerability assessments, how many risk assessments. When did that happen? I want to know. I want to see it. That's the first question. I also want to know, though, who was, how it was divvied up. Mm -hmm. Because you had, outside of a certain perimeter, you had the local police handling it. And yet they're all supposed to be on like the same radio frequency and shit like that, because this is an event that they're all working together. But you essentially it, it's almost like having a baseball team and, and a football team, you know, go do their thing on training camp and then say we're going to do training camp together. That's how it feels to me. That That's always been that's always been a thought and a problem. Um, but you look at companies that have actually taken that. And, and use tech in order to perfect that communications. Yes. Does the fire department talk dif differently than the EMS who talks differently than the police department who talks differently than the federal government who talks differently than federal law enforcement, probably uh, to an extent of how they name things, how they talk about things, but comms have become so much better because you've got companies like Mike Rogers who, who Mike Rogers runs CRG, right? So it's basically one map uh, that perfects the comms. So that no everybody's talking the same language. So whether or not you divvy up the responsibilities doesn't really matter as long as everyone is aware of who's working where and doing what. It's almost like mm. a grid. We we do it in a grid. It, it, it's the same as if you have a major if you have a major case, if you have a kidnapping, if you have uh, a watch list and you're looking in a particular area, everybody knows their grid. Once that grid's checked off, then we know, okay, we've gotten through K1 through K10. Now we're moving we're moving into L, right? And we're moving to the next very systematic. So again, I I have to believe that that was in place. I just don't know why that high ground was not watched. You know, uh, one of my buddies today from West Point, he, he sent me a text. He said, dude, as a brand new second lieutenant coming right out of commissioning, the first thing you're taught is to take the high ground. That's mm. the key. You know, so why did no one take that high ground? Why did nobody watch that high ground? That's my that's my concern. Um, comms, I think were, I think comms were probably pretty good as to who was where and doing what. Yeah. Just that they didn't have that. That wasn't part of that advanced risk assessment, that site survey. What does this look like? I had talked to a couple people today off the record, and I know our other guy did as well, that seemed to be pointing to the fact that a lot of this boiled down to not necessarily not having sites on these things once it was happening, but a lack of action when when they had the opportunity. This guy was crawling on the roof for at least seven to eight minutes. And on that note, actually, he accessed this via a ladder that does not show up on Google Maps when you when you pull up the satellite imagery of it, which means it has been put there recently. And there's speculation that he may have put it there. So how far for like security in an event like this? Obviously, they have like a place where people come in. Maybe that's 400 feet out, whatever. So let's say this ladder is outside that perimeter on the day of. Shouldn't you be assessing all accesses to buildings in that area to make sure that, you know, someone's not staring through a window or could get access to a roof or something like that, i.e. they'd see something like that ladder and say, well, we got a fucking problem right here. Absolutely. And you make a great point. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to talk much about uh, my my federal government 
law enforcement time because I think that would probably violate some. Well, do I ever really give a shit about violating? <laughs> Not really, but um, I'll talk about it from my perspective when I first open the company, right? We, we got the chance to do maximum, uh, maximum Super Bowl parties. So we did one in Atlanta, oh, yes. one in Miami, right? Even there, even there, when, you know, most of these guys have their own security person, whether it be the talent or whether it be the people that are the patrons going to these things. Yet we still did, we still did a month out. We did two weeks out. We did the week out every day of the week before we did assessments of the venue. We did it hours before we did it minutes before there was there was nothing about that venue that we didn't know okay now i understand people are going to say well you know it's one it's the super bowl once a year i understand that but these this is what these guys and girls do for a living that's right this is what they do i mean they definitely have they have a big cyber presence now secret service they always have had the credit card fraud as a as a, a requirement and as something that they do but their main thing is protecting people protecting all people within uh, elected or appointed officials, right? So that's what they do for a living. So my thought, and I, I want to say this because, again, with a with a retired or an out of office or a former, this isn't this is a weird. I don't know how many times this has happened before, right? Where you have a person who's now running again for the office after he was the president, right? So yeah. so it's different, and I don't know that. I would hope the service had something in place where they had some type of SOP, some standard operating procedure that said, well, this is a little different, right? This guy does have more exposure. Yet, when I look at RFK Jr., who has asked for protection numerous times and has been denied, I wonder if the same thing kind of happened along the way here. I know he has asked for more. I don't think he's gotten more. And those those guys and girls that are doing this, these Secret Service agents, they do a, they do a marvelous job. I mean, they do what they as much as they can with very little, whether it be resources. All of them. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, like we've, we've talked about way back, you, me and you, you know, I mean, you got the people that work, people that don't work. You got the box makers, the ice, the, uh, the lemon ice distributors, and you've got the people that do the work. Right. So, um, of course, of course, you know, and you're never, you said something that this guy's crawling on six, seven, eight minutes and nobody's doing anything. Yeah. You know, there's, there's other, when I think about that, I think I can go back to times in my life where I've experienced that, right? And I can think about just simple things like people who have been involved or been present or witnessed to school shootings. They said, I thought there were firecrackers going off in the hallway. Let me tell you something, folks. If you hear, if you're in a school or in an office building and you hear fireworks going off, it's a fucking gun, period. People are shooting at you, right? Same thing there. Like you watch and you're like, ah, I'm not really sure. It could be, don't. If you see something, say something. People were saying something here. They yeah. were saying something. But the expectation is that law enforcement, security experts, Secret Service have it under control, right? That's when you go to an event like this, you go through magnetometers, you get wanded, you're being watched, you're being, there's facial recognition present, all these things. So your thought process is, I'm safe. This is the safest point I'm ever going to be right? I'm good to go. So you're not really thinking about, oh, wow, what could happen beyond this, right? So when people see something, they're not putting it together right away. That's they're right. really not. That's so right. that's, I think, that's part of the issue here. Um, nothing, there was no contingency plan in place, in my opinion, I don't know, I wasn't in on these meetings that said, hey, what if someone screams out, there's a dude on the roof with a gun? What do we do? What do we do? Well, well, they didn't have that plan. And have you seen this video I just put up on the screen? From BBC? I don't think so. All right. I, I want, I want so. you to watch this. We're, okay. we're going to watch this. So We got it. All right. Um, but what basically what that – I'll edit that out afterwards. What that guy's saying is that you have, uh, you have people behind who were not in the rally who were effectively – I guess like having a party, like a yeah, little, just a hanging little, out, yeah, like a behind the scenes, or something. yeah, behind the venue, and they're right by law enforcement. They're being told, or they're they're seeing the guy go onto the roof. They are telling law enforcement, and there's no protocol for law enforcement to radio that in or get that to Secret Service and be like, hey, we got a guy on the roof. And they also, this guy also went on to say, we all told him he had a gun too. Yes. we could we could see it, and he was crawling around up there for a bunch of time. Right. So it, it goes back to it. What was the contingency plan? What did that look like? Did somebody talk about that? 
Did somebody talk about, did somebody say, hey, let me ask you something. If they're not in the venue, but they're behind and they just want to watch it from afar, what do we do if they call out some type of risk or some type of vulnerability? Hey, I think that guy has a gun and he's up on the roof. He's not just trying to watch, you know, what's going on from the rooftop. Uh, he's really not, you know, he's not climbing up in the tree to check it out and see, Hey, what's going on over there. He knows what's going on over there. Thank you for watching the video guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clips full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.